Thanks for coming to this session instead of one of the other ones that I'm competing with. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about is how we can actually rethink the role of government in a way that allows us to think of government as an entrepreneur, thinking out of the box, taking risks, welcoming failure instead of just fearing it. Okay, at some point I'm going to stop spinning. Um, and it's, it's a really important question because today there's all these different countries not just trying to pursue growth, some sort of generic economic growth, but really trying to pursue, if you want, long one growth. So smart, innovation-led growth. They want that growth to lead to less, not more inequality. That's the inclusive growth bit. And of course, we want growth to be sustainable over time, not just in the, in the green sense, but also making sure, if you want, we refill the pockets of money in both the, the public and the private sectors that can fund again in the future. Um, and of course, in countries like the UK and the US, there's also, oh, I guess I took that, that graph out, um, this whole issue about rebalancing economies away from speculative, short-term, uh, finance-led growth towards some sort of real economy, uh, you know, innovation policies back on the agenda. Let me just say something about that fourth point there in case I forget. This is like when I tell jokes, I sometimes tell people the punchline before um, I get to the end in case I forget. And this whole question about, you know, why is innovation policy back on the agenda of so many different countries, including the US, the UK, across Europe, across Africa, across Latin America, after almost being a blasphemy for many years. And it is this whole issue, if you want, that we've just emerged from a financial crisis where Again, many countries are now trying to nurture the real economy, industry, away from finance. And I just want to say now, so I'll get it out of the way, that that's a problematic way to position the need for innovation policy. Why? Because this notion that we had all this kind of bad finance, hedge funds, derivatives, credit default swaps, versus the real economy, right? Industry. Um, and somehow we need innovation policy to fuel the real economy. The reason that's a problematic narrative or context through which to position the much needed innovation policy is that unfortunately in many countries, especially the Anglo-Saxon uh, uh, model, if you want countries, we have a super financialized real economy. Industry is financialized. Some leaders in IT and pharmaceuticals even energy companies, well in fact I shouldn't say even, especially the energy companies, are today spending more, in some cases, I'll get back to this in the end, on areas like share buybacks just to boost their stock prices, stock options, executive pay, than on R&D. And I'm going to say it now, which is just to say that innovation policy must actually come together, if you want, with issues around corporate governance and financial market reform for that fourth battle there to really be won. Now anyway, stepping back again, you know, one of the biggest battles, um, and I'm an economist, is how to actually talk about these four challenges I just put up there. Smart growth, inclusive growth, sustainable growth, growth and rebalancing. Um, and, and as an economist, if you want, it's just so striking how little economists have really engaged with uh, the way, if you want, that government can actually think about these challenges in a sort of mission-oriented way, a way that actually considers how government can do more than just de-risk, do more than just correct different types of market failures. And Keynes, of course, one of the great economists of all time, you know, also told us often that unfortunately practical people, right, businessmen and women or policymakers who think that they're completely free of theoretical influence, they're just doing things on the ground, right, they're the doers, are actually often slaves of some defunct economist. Um, and he also said uh, something very interesting, so I'm, I'm going to be playing around with these two quotes throughout the talk. He said that, you know, the whole point of government is actually not just to do little things, right, tinkering on the edges, making things a bit better or a bit worse, but to really be doing those things which are not present and not being done at all. And I want to basically argue that this whole notion of what's not being done at all and what, therefore, government should do to enable us to have the kind of socioeconomic growth we want is really being today uh, talked about in a very narrow way, again, coming back to Keynes' quote, being slaves of defunct economists, because the only way that we tend to talk about the role of government is either to create kind of background conditions, 
people sometimes talk about this in terms of leveling the playing field, right? Con create the conditions for the business sector to do its really dynamic thing. Um, or at best, we talk about it in terms of the need to solve and to invest in different areas that are characterized by market failures. For example, if you have basic research, which is a public good, and it's very hard for private firms to appropriate the returns from that because of the great spillovers, then of course we need government to step in and to fund that area. Um, if you have negative externalities like pollution that companies aren't incorporating into their uh, costs, you might need something like a carbon tax, right? So correcting these different types of market failures. And what I basically have been trying to argue is that this way of talking about the role of government, so at best creating different types of bandages, right, which fixes markets, is a narrow way to talk about things. And we actually have to almost go back to some ways that historians have talk about, talked about the problem of government. And there's this wonderful uh, book, which I really recommend people read, written in 1944 by Karl Polanyi, where he actually looks at the role of markets from the beginning of capitalism. And he argues that the market itself, right, so it's not market versus state, the market itself was actually forced on by uh, different types of government policy. Uh, there's this wonderful quote here. He says, the road to free markets was open and kept open by an enormous increase in continuous centrally organized and control interventionism. Administrators, so government bureaucrats, had to constantly, had to be constantly on the watch to ensure the free working of the system. In other words, there's nothing natural about the market process itself. It was actually deeply shaped and created from the beginning of capitalism by, if you want, different types of public policies, whether these were tariffs, uh, child labor laws, IPR, the whole enclosure movement, if, if you want, was an, in fact a result of policy. By the way, he says something else, which is he looks at all markets, and he looks at local markets, you know, where people sort of sell fruit or vegetables on the corner of a street, and international markets, and he says those two actually have been around for thousands and thousands of years. But the national market, which is the capitalist market, which is recent, 250, 300 years old, it's this market that actually was deeply shaped um, and in fact co-created by government policies. And this is just something that we don't think about today because we constantly talk about sort of state versus market forces, and yes, we need public-private partnerships, but if we don't have a way to talk about the public side in terms of both its role historically, but also especially its role today in really thinking about those big challenges I uh, talked about at the beginning, and if we're limited to talking about the public side of public-private partnerships, in terms of de-risking, which is a really lame word if you think about it, you're just de-risking the private sector, or correcting with little bandages here and there when things go wrong, it's going to be really hard to think about those four big challenges I talked about. Uh, sorry, this is a very self-promotional slide here, but what I argue in this book, The Entrepreneurial State, which has been translated in different languages, and I love looking at how it's actually been translated, so in Germany they called it Das Kapital, which I'm sure most of you know, is a great book by Karl Marx, uh, this staff, which is actually a really interesting way to put it, which is the capital of the state. So if you think about the state not just spending, but actually investing in you know, long-run growth and making choices and taking massive risks, you know, that's capital expenditure. <laughs> and there's all sorts of issues that we might get to in the question and answer period in terms of what this means for how we calculate deficits and debt levels. But anyway, what I argue in this book is basically if we think about the role that government really has played in places like Silicon Valley, right? Or I would argue today in China, or in some parts of Germany, or in places like Brazil today, where they really have a very active innovation-led growth strategy. This mythological way to talk about the public and private sector where all the real energy, creativity, and dynamism and thinking out of the box happens in business. Right? And the public sector there, this Kafkian figure, yes, it's needed, but it's just about kind of creating the right playing field, is just completely wrong. Why is it wrong? Because in fact, the kinds of investments that led to so many of the different products that we actually associate with Silicon Valley, and I'll do my little iPhone story in a minute, actually required lots of thinking big, thinking out of the box, risk-taking, mission-oriented investments inside the public sector. And so I focus on not just any kind of technology, 
in innovation, but the big technological changes, what economists call general purpose technologies. And so the question is, what was the role of government policy in, if you want, the emergence of these different technologies? Was it just fixing different problems here and there? Or did government actually have to make some pretty scary choices directing investments in particular areas, not just creating the incentives for the business community to make them? Um, and so what I'm going to be doing, basically, is bringing you through a story about uh, mainly Silicon Valley, because this is the area of the world that we're constantly told is market-led. And I'm going to uh, guide you through these different questions, which I'll actually talk about in the end, but I just wanted to put them up here now, which is how do we actually think about directionality within the public sector? How can we assess these investments when they're actually about shaping and creating markets? How can we build the kind of public sector organizations that are willing to think big and to welcome failure instead of fear it? And how can we actually get not just innovation-led growth, but also inclusive growth by sharing not only the risks, but also the rewards? And so in terms of the entrepreneurial state, as I mentioned, I'm not just thinking about little, little technological changes here and there, but the big ones. And first of all, the point is, you know, this has required government to think about risk, right? This upper right-hand quadrant here, uh, which, you know, that word radical there is a bit, mis uh, could be misunderstood because there's lots of incremental changes as well, which are characterized by massive technological and market risk. And so looking at these different sectors, whether it's the internet, biotech, nanotech, and actually looking at who invested where in those four quadrants is quite striking. First of all, if you think of the whole innovation chain, from basic research to the famous uh, Death Valley period, uh, applied research, early stage funding for companies, and when the product actually comes out, you immediately find, if you look at these uh, orange words here, so National Science Foundation, NIH, DARPA, ARPA-E, you see the role of the public sector not only in that kind of upstream basic research public good area which market failure theory justifies. You actually see a very active visible hand, not an invisible hand, along the entire chain. Uh, that's point number one, the whole chain, not just basic research. Two, often these investments, and I'll show you some uh, specific ones in a minute, were guided, again, not by this idea, oh, we got to fix the problem here and there, even if it was downstream, but by missions, right? So man on the moon, or solving climate change, or there's also lots of investments today happening around social innovation, around the aging crisis, which you could also think of as, as, as a mission. Uh, these mission-oriented investments are something that, again, economists have had a hard time, let me just get this graph, oh well. Um, to talk about because we don't think about government in terms of having a mission, right? You're just kind of doing this kind of background research. Uh, sorry, background creation of the conditions for the private sector to do its thing. Uh, this is the data just, just to prove to you if you want how important this downstream funding has been. This is a small business innovation research program in the U.S. which has uh, provided huge amounts of what I would call patient long-term finance to small and medium-sized companies uh, through different government departments. So basically like public venture capital. And it's interesting if you look at it over time and compare it to private venture capital, that difference has actually grown, which is not intuitive. In an advanced market-based society like the US, you would think that this kind of investment could actually back off after a while once these markets were, if you want, uh, more mature. But in fact, if you know anything about venture capital, you know, what is it? It's exit-driven. They want that exit to happen in more or less three to five years, five years max, mainly through an IPO or a buyout. And actually that innovation chain and even that Death Valley period that I just showed you can take 15 to 20 years, right? So this kind of money, whether it's through uh, the US SBIR fund or in Finland, for example, through Citra, or in some countries like Germany through their public banks, public investment banks, this kind of patient finance has been very important downstream. Um, I often use the iPhone, again, just theatrically because, of course, it's the product, right, that makes us think about the importance of venture capitalists and the geniuses like Steve Jobs or more uh, modern day names, people like Elon Musk, right, all these great uh, minds. And actually, it's not that they weren't smart. Of course, these people are very smart and we don't have enough of them and the world would be a better place if we had more of them. But what we don't admit is just how much of their genius, 
benefited from being able to surf a massive wave of direct government investments in particular areas. So if you ask yourself what actually makes the iPhone smart and not idiotic, it's of course what you can do with it. Sorry, I'm not leaving. Uh, <laughs> and so the internet, which allows you, you know, to surf the web, that came from investments through DARPA and the Department of Defense. Uh, GPS, which allows you to know where you are with your phone. That was also uh, government funded mainly through the Navy and Department of Defense. <laughs> um, Siri, right, which you can talk into, it never works on my phone. Mm. You should ask it if God exists. It says something very funny. Um, and touchscreen display, which allows even little kids to be able to work with things like the iPad and the iPhone, all government funded. This is not to say that the government did everything, of course not. You needed Apple and its wonderful team of designers to think about how to put those technologies together in a really cool way with their concept of simplicity, et cetera. But, you know, the fact that we have an 800-page biography of Steve Jobs and Apple, where not one page, one paragraph, one sentence, one word talks about these public investments, that's the problem. Okay, so this is not public versus private. It's not to say the state did everything, but we know, of course, what the private sector did. And when we talk about the public sector's role, if we talk about it, which this book does not, uh, uh, we again talk about it in this very lame way without admitting that actually each and every one of these investments was a result of entrepreneurial risk taking because in fact they chose particular directions and for every internet, you had plenty of failures that you simply don't know about. Right? So it's not a linear process. There's lots of trial and error, experimentation, exploration. It does lead to lots of failure. And this is why it's really important to actually understand how some of these organizations worked, like DARPA, where uh, in particularly DARPA has been studied quite a bit organizationally in the fact that people sort of are able to come in and work for five years and they're in fact told to be crazy, do your thing, don't worry, think big, is really interesting model for government, right? So it's, it's not easy to reproduce. ARPA-E today in the Department of Energy is trying to reproduce that kind of uh, organizational structure. And you know, one thing is also the budgets. For example, ARPA-E does not have the kind of budget that DARPA had when it was investing in areas like the internet. And that also brings us to the political situation that of course we are in today in the US where there's less support in some ways for these kinds of investments. Um, now, when I do put up that uh, iPhone graph, people get scared, especially my progressive friends who start seeing, you know, Navy, CIA, Department of Defense. They say, Mariana, what are you talking about? This is the military industrial complex. You can't tell us that we need that. And I say, yeah, yeah, don't worry. That's, you know, what's interesting is how that ended up becoming, in some ways, a model for other government departments. For example, the Department of Health which through the National Institutes of Health has been spending, as you can see, since from 1936 to 2011, close to $800 billion. But even after the crisis, the financial crisis in 2012, spent close to $31 billion. And this money, again, is not just in kind of background areas. It's that whole innovation chain, lots of applied research. And there's a wonderful book by Marsha Angel. She is hated by the pharmaceutical companies because what does she do? She, she was the ex-editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. She did a wonderful study called The Truth Behind the Drug Companies where she took the 20 big blockbuster drugs of the last um, 20 years when she wrote the book, which was 2004, and showed that that kind of funding from the National Institutes of Health in fact was responsible for almost all the revolutionary drugs. What does that mean? The new molecular entities with priority rating. Okay, so again, getting away from this mythological portrayal of all the revolutionaries of, you know, the, the Zuckerberg types and government at best, this bureaucratic machine facilitating the process completely dies when you actually look at specific sectors and ask yourself who really took on the big risks and who came later. And again, this isn't good guy, bad guy, it's just really explaining how that kind of in innovation ecosystem worked. And the whole biotech sector actually was born through these investments. For sure, the Kleiner Perkins of this world, which were the biotech uh, specific VCs, so the venture capital uh, uh, company, for example, that funded Genentech, uh, they again uh, surfed this massive wave of NIH type funding that occurred 20 years before this sector even had a name. Um, 
Now, as I mentioned before, I mean, if you look at these actual organizations, I mean, the word mission is all over them, but we don't have a way to talk about it. Just look at the first one. Creating breakthrough technologies for national security is the mission of DARPA. The ARPA mission is to catalyze the development of transformational technologies. NIS, uh, National Institutes of Health mission, uh, or the mission of the KFW Group, which is the German uh, public bank. This is just something that we don't know how to talk about in economics. And why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because then those countries that try to copy the Silicon Valley model or, uh, or you know, and specifically across, you know, thinking about this innovation chain and thinking that all you need to do is fund some basic science and perhaps some science industry links along the way without actually also thinking through how to build these organizations that can think big in a mission-oriented way is, is an issue. Um, now, if you look at across the world, it's also interesting to see when you look at the actual investments that have taken place in order for government to actually fuel, if you want, the private sector's investments in innovation, which is a huge problem in many countries across Europe, for example, where we have very low BIRD, business R&D spending. It's fascinating to compare the direct versus indirect expenditure. The indirect expenditure there is the blue line, direct is uh, gray. And it's interesting that, again, countries like the US, which we pretend are all about private initiative, are one of those that, in terms of the balance between direct and indirect, has the greatest direct spending. And in fact, there's very little evidence for things like R&D tax credits when they happen on their own. So a country like Canada, which really focuses a lot on these indirect measures, has not uh, been able to, in fact, fuel its business sector spending. Why? Because when do businesses invest in innovation? They don't invest simply by reducing their costs today. They invest when they see a potential opportunity. This, by the way, is what Keynes meant, John Maynard Keynes, when he talked about animal spirits. What drives private sector investments are the expectations about these future growth areas. Um, and so what, you know, one of the roles that these direct expenditures have is, in fact, creating this space, creating that landscape, creating the expectations about a future area. And then the business sector comes in and that's when the R&D tax credits might make a difference. It's sort of the marginal uh, spending decision. But in those countries which have tried to do this simply through R&D tax credits, uh, they basically have not been able to achieve uh, an innovation economy because they've ignored just how much money uh, governments have had to spend directly in particular areas to make big things happen. This is the problem today, of course, in Europe where we're pretending that countries like Portugal, Italy, Greece and Spain, the famous pigs, I'm allowed to say this because I'm Italian, but this is a terrible word that Goldman Sachs uh, used to name the weakest countries in the Eurozone. This idea that somehow these countries were just spending too much, right? A bunch of lazy bastards having fun on the beach while the Germans were productively uh, you know, working and the government was remaining within its confines is completely wrong when you look at all the investments in innovation-led growth where Germany spent more than twice per capita than many of these countries. Uh, Spain, in order to stay within this new constraint they have of the 3% deficit rule in Europe, has cut its publicly funded R&D by 40% since 2009. But anyway, the point being that these pigs completely jump out when you look at gross R&D spending, that's the GERD there, as a percentage of GDP and this whole kind of way of talking about what should be happening in Europe today in order to create a more balanced, less skewed competitiveness across countries has completely ignored, if you want, this innovation story that I've been talking about where you have a lack of innovation-led growth happening in these countries for the last 20 years. Um, it's also interesting, of course, to look at the relationship between, as I mentioned already, this public funding and the bird spending. What you see is those countries that spend the least uh, that have the business community that spends the least uh, in R&D happen to also be those countries where you have the least public spending in R&D. And so this relationship between the public and private side and what exactly the role is of the public side going beyond just de-risking is a, a real challenge, I think, for not just people like me, innovation economists, but definitely policymakers in any region like your own that are trying to build innovation ecosystems. Um, how much more time do I have? I don't see the person who was supposed to tell me. Oh, well. Sorry? Huh? Half an hour. Wow. I feel sorry for you. That's a long time. You really want me to talk that long? Okay. <laughs> so I've just been talking about, you know, missions like Man on the Moon. And of course, as we know, 
one of the big missions that many countries are thinking about today is the green agenda, right? Solving, well not solving, but really tackling climate change. So you have Germany, for example, with its energy bend policy, really thinking uh, uh, concretely about that. And it's, it's, it's interesting, before I get to the green investments, just to say, what is green, right? Green isn't really a revolution if you think of all the technologies, right? So solar, wind, and biofuels, they've been around for quite a long time. It's the real issue of how to transform an economy in that green direction that would be the real revolution and, and you know, get these investments in these different areas of renewable energy almost as a portfolio approach, funding the whole lot instead of just betting on one. But it's also about thinking about deployment, diffusion. So think back to one of the general purpose technologies I put at the beginning, mass production. Mass production was not only revolutionary at the production level, right, allowing a huge economies of scale to happen in the production sector across different industries. It also, it would not have had the effect that it did have across the entire economy without also policies like suburbanization. Suburbanization, which was government, uh, you know, came out of government policy basically. Um, in other words, people didn't just wake up and want to go live in the suburbs. Um, allowed the mass production revolution to get fully deployed throughout the whole economy. So one way to think about green, if you think of the IT revolution, which many people like Robert Solo, but I think also Eric Brynjolfsson have argued haven't really been, um, we, we still haven't taken uh, the full advantage that we could of that particular revolution. It hasn't been fully deployed across all firms, sectors, and even households. Green could become a redirection or a direction through which IT gets fully deployed. So Carlotta Perez have, and I have been writing a bit about that, but that's just to remind us that this is not just about technology. It's, you know, in terms of the emergence of the technology, it's also about the diffusion of these technologies which have always required a direction. Mass production on its own would not have had the effect that it did without the, one of the directions that it took in terms of suburbanization. Anyway, these technologies do matter though. So it's interesting coming back to that quadrant that I put up before and asking who actually is investing in that upper right-hand quadrant. And what's interesting, if you look at different databases that exist like uh, Bloomberg New Energy Finance or some data that is um, at the Climate Policy Institute in uh, California, there's very little private finance in that upper right-hand quadrant. Um, there is also in this particular sector, unlike in IT, very active role in terms of public banks in terms of the deployment of green technology. So these development finance institutions have spent something like eight times as much as the entire worldwide private sector, all venture capital, private equity, stock market, and corporate money. And it's interesting that we don't really know how to talk about it, right? So this is the numbers here for the public bank in Germany, which has been a crucial pillar of Germany's energy bend policy, which again is about transforming the whole country in this um, green um, uh, direction. And, you know, not only is this public bank doing the classic Keynesian thing, which is counter cyclical spending, right, which is one of the things that people like Stiglitz and Krugman are telling us today. They say the world is in a bad situation because for the first time, basically, since World War II, we have governments around the world acting like business, so pro cyclical, investing little in the bust, too much in the boom. Um, so not only is this bank doing the opposite, it's counter-cyclical. When the crisis hit, they massively increased their loans and their disbursements, but actually are directing financing in this energy vend uh, uh, area. This often makes people worry. Oh no, a bunch of bureaucrats in this public bank deciding that this country is going to go in this green direction. Well, hey, I just showed you the iPhone picture. <laughs> All those technologies were picked. Right? So this is not about picking or not picking, shale gas. Shale and fracking was totally picked. There's a wonderful uh, report by the Breakthrough Institute in California which shows just how much government money went into the emergence of fracking and shale gas which would not be there today without that. So, so one of the things that's missing from this whole debate really is how do we make these decisions? Right? How can governments also, for example, nurture democratic debate with civil society about whether or not to pursue you know, 
the energy then strategy or not. Of course, this doesn't mean that people should actually, everyone should vote on whether we invest in biotech. That would be completely chaotic. It's good to have what we call the Haldane principle, which is that many of these investments are also science-led. But this broader issue of directionality, I think, has been really, um, has been, if you want, hurt by this notion that somehow we shouldn't be picking winners, picking directions, and hasn't actually structure the conversation in terms of how, what can we learn from how these directions were set in the past by some countries which actually have achieved smart innovation-led growth. These figures I'm just putting up to shock you, which is the Chinese Development Bank, not just the German Development Bank or the Brazilian Development Bank, has been investing massively in specific companies, right? Again, not just creating the conditions. Huawei, number one in the world today in telecommunications, received a massive loan from the, this Chinese development bank, I think it was $4 billion uh, worth, but also these green companies as well. And again, lots of these investments fail. <laughs> uh, and that's just part of the game, right? And you know, either we get the venture capitalists to actually do their job <laughs> and invest in the really early stage, which they don't, they tend to come in later. Uh, in, in biotech they came in later, in nanotech they came in later, in the internet economy they came in later, so someone had to fund that early phase. In some countries, this happens through these development banks, and because innovation is extremely uncertain, many of these investments fail. So this is one of the questions as well. It's not just about understanding how do these organizations do it, but also how are they going to think about these investments as a portfolio. And when it's these investment banks doing it, what's interesting is by definition, because they're investment banks, it's interesting to see how some public investors have thought about both the risks and the returns which I'll get to in my last five minutes. But this is just to say that it's interesting, if you look at so many reports, whether it's through the World Bank or also economics research that has looked at this kind of funding, we're often told that these banks, for example, are crowding out private finance. The Brazilian Development Bank today is under massive attack for crowding out Brazilian private banks. And what's missing from that analysis is the ability to actually show empirically even just statistically in some ways, um, you know, who has invented, sorry, invested in how much across those four quadrants and to what degree actually have these investments created that market, right? Created a market which then the private sector, if you want, can play in and do all sorts of interesting things in. But this is again coming into the whole sort of surfing the wave. And so the degree to which we even have tools to, through which to talk about and to evaluate this market creation process I think is very uh, problematic. And hence, we very easily fall back on this kind of crowding out versus crowding in. Even crowding in, which is the opposite of crowding out, was not even meant in terms of the macroeconomics framework through which it's used to talk about this process of creating courageously a landscape that just doesn't exist. Um, and one of the biggest problems really today in this energy space is the degree to which the private sector, the big private companies are really even committing resources to this. Because don't forget, as I mentioned before, the state doesn't do everything, of course not. The private sector has always played a crucial role. Don't forget uh, Xerox Park and Bell Labs were private laboratories, for example, uh, Bell Labs in AT&T, uh, which co-invested alongside the state. In fact, the labs themselves were co-funded by the state, but you still had big companies investing alongside the state in these big new areas which led to these, if you want, mission-oriented investments that led to things like uh, the internet. One of the real problems today is the degree to which we actually have, for example, in the green area, big energy companies actually playing that role. And this really gets to the big question that I want to finish with, which is, how can we go beyond this narrative of just having innovation-led growth and smart growth and innovation ecosystems and public-private partnerships and actually really build more symbiotic and mutualistic partnerships between the public and the private sector, as opposed to what I would argue in a bit of a harsh, provocative way, the current kind of uh, predator-prey parasitic uh, ecosystems we have. Because don't forget, I should say this in case you don't know, Bell Labs, which is this important laboratory within AT&T, which funded a lot of really important innovations with public money, actually came out of a deal with government, right? So AT&T was a massive monopoly, uh, was, was at the time starting to not reinvest its profits back into the economy, a problem we have today, where we have record level hoarding rates, literally money under pillows in both the US and in Europe. In the US it's two trillion, two trillion dollars being hoarded, 
okay, not spent. So government basically said to AT&T in the end of the 1920s, you know, invest, <laughs> reinvest your profits back into the economy and invest in the big stuff, in innovation, and we'll help you. And so Bell Labs, in a way, I mean, this is a very simplistic way to tell the story. There's a wonderful book on uh, Bell Labs, but the point is that it, it emerged through a tension, a healthy tension with, with, with government, which said, you know, we, we're going to allow you to retain this monopoly status. Think of Google today, massive monopoly if you reinvest your profits back into the big stuff with us. And so I would argue that today, not only are we missing a new deal in the Keynesian sense, which many people have been arguing about, but we're even just missing a deal, a proper deal between public and private. And we also, again, as I've been arguing, don't have a way to talk about that public side. Um, not just our businesses hoarding at record levels, but also, as I mentioned in the beginning, spending an increasing amount of money just focus on their stock prices, stock options, and stock options, as you know, is the key way that many top executives get paid. If you look at that blue line, that's the one that should scare you. So not only is there the absolute number, which is the Fortune 500 companies have spent three trillion on buybacks in the last decade, but also the black line is showing you R&D, uh, sorry, uh, repurchases, so buybacks over R&D, and since the early 2000s, this number has just gone crazy. Don't forget that, for example, Apple, under Steve Jobs, no buybacks, none. Tim Cook, this is his big idea. <laughs> um, and I'm not the first to criticize it, even though we just wrote a nice article, actually, three years ago, on what Apple should be doing with this money, instead of on these 60 billion share buyback schemes. But also in different sectors, so the two sectors that are spending the most on buybacks are energy and pharmaceuticals. And when you ask these companies, which I have, what are you doing? Why aren't you reinvesting these profits in sort of the big new areas of the future, these missions that I mentioned in the beginning? They say there's no opportunities. There's no opportunities of investment in renewable energy. There's no opportunities in the whole life science revolution. Of course there are, and I just showed you some figures on who's actually investing in these opportunities. But, um, you know, again, this is, this is one of the issues. And when you hear people say, oh, it's the market. It's the market forcing us to do this bad stuff. It's the short-termism of, of the market. Then you ask, well, what is the market? The market is an outcome of the interaction between different actors, right? Public actors, private actors, even households that can or may not make the uh, in, uh, decision to invest in certain areas. And so as soon as you say the market is an outcome, one of the you know, issues around public policy should be actually forming, if you want, some ideas or debates around what do we want from these actors? And is this good? For an innovation-led economy? I don't know. And then you look at any sector like telecommunications, and you already see this is really clear. You have the top two companies, Huawei and Ericsson, doing no share buybacks. Cisco, massive. It's one of the companies that has the biggest amount in terms in relation to their net earnings. So there's choices to be made. And we might have to talk about those choices a bit more if we want these kind of new missions of the future actually to be funded. Um, why is this important in terms of perhaps one of the biggest debates around, the, around today after Piketty's wonderful book, what is the relationship between all this and inequality? I would argue a huge amount. When companies don't reinvest their profits back into the real economy, that creates less jobs, it creates less good jobs, but also look at that curve there uh, from 1980 going up, right? This is income inequality in the U.S., which if you've read Piketty's book, he argues is because of the changing relationship between the rate of return on capital, which, well, I won't go into the debates over how he's measured it, the, the relationship between the rate of return on capital and the rate of return on growth, so the, the growth rate, sorry. And he argues that capital, the rate of return on capital just started to escalate in proportion to the rate of return on growth, but then you start asking, well, what actually happened in those years? And Warren Buffett is probably one of the smartest guys out there, not just uh, ideas. He also knew how to make money from all this. He specifically talks about something that happened in 1976. Uh, he says, you know, why did we reduce capital gains tax by 50% between 1976 and 1981 in the U.S.? He said, why do we do that? That doesn't make people invest more. He said, I never thought about capital gains even when it was 39.9% in 1976. I invest when I see an opportunity, as I mentioned before. This is even more true in the innovation economy. 
So why did capital gains fall? Buffett doesn't talk about this, neither does Piketty. It was the National Venture Capital Association that had just formed, I tell a story about this in my book, uh, and made it one of their missions, if you can think of this as a mission, to lobby government hard and hard to reduce that tax in the name of entrepreneurship, innovation, and risk taking. Ignoring completely the fact that actually they themselves had been making and then continued to make their investments, not in areas where capital gains was low or any tax rate was low, but where the government had actually really fueled the whole new area. And so a question is, what does then this fall do to the ability of government to continue investing if we keep withering away at the tax base in the name of innovation? Don't forget, by the way, that when NASA was set up, the National Aerospace uh, Agency in the US, what the top marginal rate was under our communist president of the time, General Eisenhower, uh, I'm being facetious of course, 90% top marginal rate, uh, you know, this whole issue of you know, what is the relationship between tax and investment is, is a very shady area. This is not to say we should go back to that tax rate necessarily, but just to say all this stuff around tax really has just affected inequality, not investments. Um, so let me just finish by saying, going back to that first slide where I said we need smart innovation-led growth, inclusive growth, green growth, and rebalancing, well, this is only going to happen if we actually think these things through in a way that doesn't go back to the state versus private or just de-risking or just market failure debate, but also perhaps thinks a bit more uh, realistically about how to make sure that we don't just socialize the risks, but also the rewards. Had even just some of the profits, 1%, of the internet profits gone back into something like a state innovation fund to fund green, we would have much more money today to throw at areas like ARPA-E so it could do the DARPA thing for green tech that DARPA did for the internet. Instead, what we have is, don't, I'll just tell you the punchline here, we have things like the Beidol Act, which uh, in the name of commercialization allowed publicly funded research to get uh, patented, which was actually a pretty good idea, except they went overboard. And whereas in that law, it actually says, hey, we better be careful. We don't want the taxpayer to pay twice for all this research and then really high prices of drugs. Uh, we should allow the government, therefore, it says it in the act, to put a cap on the drug prices because it was government funded. Government has never exercised that right. So you end up with this dysfunctional situation where this drug here, which is a drug marketed by Genzyme, the taxpayers themselves who funded the drug can't even buy it. And in countries that have a welfare state where the state is paying for it, you're still paying twice. Um, so I've basically been arguing that perhaps we should get a bit real. <laughs> and you know, when Tesla got 465 million in a guaranteed loan from Obama recently, Solyndra got almost the same, 500 million. Solyndra went bust, Tesla didn't. The statistics, as any venture capitalist will tell you, is that for every Tesla, you've got about 10 Solyndras. Or for every internet, you've got about 10 Concords. <laughs> Um, and so really thinking of it in terms of, of a portfolio, whether it's through equity, whether it's through royalties, something, the prices of the products, as the Beidol Act had argued, something should allow us to really think through these investments more in terms of a portfolio, admitting that it's going to take a lot of risk taking, a lot of failures, and if, if only we can actually think creatively about how to actually make some of the upside profits to go back into an innovation fund which can fund the future innovations, but also the welfare state, right? I mean, this is what the state investment banks do. They also, those returns go back to the treasury, which then can also fund education. So we don't get the kind of Silicon Valley kind of deformation where the public school system has gone completely down the drain when actually the public sector itself was investing in these technologies which allowed the Google, you know, Google's algorithm was funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, so we get a mo much more symbiotic ecosystem. And just to say the only way to start that battle is to think again this cartoon image which is really just justifying a theft. I was a history major in my undergrad and uh, I remember reading this wonderful book by uh, Rodolfo Cunha called Mexico Ocupada, which was a history of the Mexican-American War. And it starts off with a cartoon image, right? This is a cartoon too. Cartoon image of the lazy Mexican, right? Mexican with a sombrero under a palm tree, really lazy, sitting with a, with a bottle of, uh, what's it called? What's the alcohol in Mexico called? Tequila. Tequila? No, there's one that starts with M. Mezcal? Anyway. <laughs> um, and he argues that cartoon image 
was basically invented overnight during the Mexican-American War to justify the theft of the Mexican territory by what later became New Mexico, Arizona, California, Texas. You had to portray these people as a bunch of lazy bastards to actually take their land. And I would argue, and I know this is a bit harsh and strong, but I really think given what we've seen in terms of how inequality and innovation discourse have gone hand in hand, this cartoon image today is justifying a theft in the same way. So I encourage you, if you're trying to build an innovation economy, as I just heard you are here, that you really think through to make sure that you're not also fueling inequality at the same time, and you really have it be evidence-based on what we actually know increases your private sector's investment in the real stuff. And that's it. <laughs> I still have 10 minutes.